A star was born last weekend, and I don't mean Peter at Mayfair having his picture taken with Martha Stewart. Does the name Rich Strike mean anything to you? It didn't until, to me until last Saturday night when the three-year-old Colt came from the back of the pack, literally and figuratively, to win the Kentucky Derby in one of the greatest upsets in the history of the race. His odds were 80 to 1, the longest for a winning horse since 1913. Neither his owner, his trainer, nor his jockey had ever been associated with any horse in the Kentucky Derby before. Rich Strike wasn't even entered in the race until another horse happened to withdraw at the very last minute. Rich Strike was an alternate and wore the number 21 in a field of 20 horses. When you watch replays of the race, which I couldn't help doing over and over, you can't even see Rich Strike for the first three quarters of the race because the TV cameras don't pick up the back of the pack. Halfway around the track, he's still 16 horses behind the lead. But his jockey angles him into position to make a move, sliding up through the middle, weaving through horses ahead of him like a motorcycle in a traffic jam, darting through fleeting openings, finding his way to the inside rail. Even in the last seconds, all eyes are still only on the favorites battling for first place. As Rich Strike bolts along, bolts along the rail, the announcer barely gets his name in before it's all over. At the last second, he says in a breathless single stream, Rich Strike is coming up the inside. Oh my goodness, the longest shot has won the Kentucky Derby. It's the stuff of dreams and Hollywood. The last few years of the Derby have been weighed down by scandal, bad sportsmanship, and pandemic. Rick Dawson, the little-known owner of Rich Strike, almost left horse racing. He had become so disenchanted with the industry's corruption. But he said when he met Eric Reed, the trainer for Rich Strike, he decided to give it another chance. Eric always tells me what's going on, Dawson said. Sometimes the truth isn't good news, but it's always the truth, and I can deal with the truth. Eric Reed, a 40-year veteran trainer, nearly left horse racing himself, broken and broken-hearted after losing 23 horses in a barn fire six years ago. But when close friends, fellow trainers, and even strangers reached out offering to help Reed recover and rebuild, he decided not to let the tragedy wipe him out. He got back on the horse, as the saying goes. Eric Reed was able to find his way again and renew his life's passion. He began by acquiring this $30,000 colt, a modest sum in the world of horse racing, where the big winners cost in the millions. After last Saturday's derby, Reed told The Athletic magazine, small trainer, small rider, small stable. We should have been 80 to one, he said but I knew what I had. I knew what we had and what he was capable of. And if he ran good, anything could happen. Well, what he had was a well-trained horse with heart and spirit who was put through his daily, weekly, monthly paces. Reed explained his philosophy to reporters this way. We take care of the horse first and the rest falls into place. The win might have been part miracle, landing in the lineup by a stroke of luck. But leading up to that two-minute triumph at Churchill Downs were the months and years of daily discipline, the way, the truth, the life, if you will, of his owner's and tra trainer's integrity that prepared Rich Strike and his team for this day. No one saw them coming. But as Reed trained his unlikely colt into a world-class racehorse, he knew this animal was gifted and capable of winning. I can't help but stretch out, play with this metaphor a little bit. I think we are all called into a similar life of daily practices, 
daily rededication to our own continual growth in love and transformation as followers of Jesus, who calls himself the way, the truth, and the life. In Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis says that God became human to turn creatures into his children, not simply to make us better, but to make us entirely new humans. Lewis writes, it is not like teaching a horse to jump better and better, but like turning a horse into a winged creature. This spirit of transformation is in Acts, where Peter has a vision in which every kind of animal, reptile, bird, and beast of prey that Jews, like Peter, were forbidden to eat, according to their Mosaic law, descend on a sheet before him. And a voice from heaven says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Three times the voice speaks, and three times Peter protests, by no means, Lord. He has never eaten these defiled things. What God has made clean, you must not call profane, the voice says. And on waking from his trance, at that very moment, the text says, three Gentiles show up at his door. People whom up to that moment, Peter would view with the same lens through which he viewed those repugnant animals in his vision, unclean and outside his moral sphere. And God challenges Peter to consider something new, something radical, something world-altering. Peter has to make a flash decision whether to listen to the voice of love and inclusion or to stick with his long-standing law and tradition that allows divisions and distinctions even requires them, calling outsiders unclean and unholy. Peter hears a voice tell him not to discriminate against the Gentiles, not to make his usual distinction between them and us. Peter is suddenly confronted with a seismic shift in his belief system about who God loves and includes within God's saving embrace, and by extension, about who Peter must include and love. Would he, would he have been prepared for this decisive moment without his years of walking the, on the path with Jesus? Had he not been following the daily path of the way, the truth, and the life that Jesus taught him? Would he have been able to make the connection between the unclean animals God was calling clean in his strange vision and the human strangers who appeared on his doorstep? If Peter had not been prepared to be open to such a radical change of heart, had he instead made the quick and safer choice to shut out that new voice of risky love and inclusion, there's a good chance you and I would not be sitting here today. Peter's radical shift may appear to have taken place in a moment's decision, but it was his training in the way of love, his daily practice of following the way of the Spirit staying close to Jesus' teaching and example that made Peter ready for the change the world needed, though it was unthinkable and radically new. This is our path, too. We're not called into a life of waiting for sudden miracles, though miracles may happen. We're called to practice the daily path of faithfulness that makes us ready when faced with the challenge to exercise radical love when our hurting world needs it. Because that's when miracles can start happening. This is the love of Jesus' new commandment. Jesus takes the ancient and beautiful commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, and he makes it new. He makes it new by upping the ante on how it is we are to love our neighbors. Love one another, he said as I have loved you. As Jesus has loved us is a love that we can hardly wrap our heads around. It raises the bar on any kind of self-satisfied feelings we have about the love we show to the people who are easy to love. By extreme contrast, the way Jesus loves us is with a love that cares for our enemies as much as for our friends. 
It's a love that works for the well-being of the person who has betrayed us or the person we have betrayed as much as for our own well-being. It's the love that values the lives of people who have done us no favors or even done us in. The way Jesus loves us is the way he sits close to Judas at the Last Supper, feeds him, and tenderly washes his feet, knowing Judas is on his way out the door to sell Jesus out for a pocket of silver. The way Jesus loves us is the way he loves Peter, who three times blatantly and publicly denies he ever even met Jesus. The way Jesus loves us is the way he loves those first disciples, all of whom hide silently in the shadows, saying and doing nothing, while Jesus stands trial and is handed over to be mocked and beaten and crucified. The heart of the Easter story is this transformative love on display. After all of Jesus' betrayal and pain and humiliation, abandonment and death, He appears to his friends and forgives them without hesitation, without the expectation that they will confess to their weaknesses in his darkest hour. And that extreme unearned love cracks open their hard and fearful hearts. You might call Jesus' radical love foolish. It's a love we can't imagine has any use. We philosophize, why should I love my enemy? We calculate, what will I get out of it? But the way Jesus loves us is with a radical love that transforms the guilt-ridden or weary or grieving or fearful or angry individuals into entirely new humans. It transforms good jumpers into winged creatures. The love Jesus has for us and commands us to have for one another is the love that makes dead things come to life. But this new kind of love doesn't come automatically to us. We must walk that daily way of preparation in which we practice listening for the voice of the same spirit that spoke to Peter. Practice a daily commitment to the way, the truth, and the life of God that prepares us to love the people in situations that really challenge our prejudices. That's the love that makes the green blade rise from the buried grain. And not only the springtime growth that's showing up in every yard and forest, nook and cranny of this lush, verdant corner of Connecticut right now. It's the same love that calls us back to life again when our wintry hearts grieve and have pain, to borrow the words from that gorgeous anthem the joyful noise just sang so joyfully. As we walk our daily path along Jesus' way, the truth, and the life, God is making us and all things new by loving us into being, even while we're still lost and unlovely. God loves us into children of God, unlikely racehorses, winged creatures even, preparing us to win that that humanly impossible race of choosing love over hate, embrace over exclusion, This radical love of God is the longest shot that always wins.